Hey there, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Devani, the Total Connector. Really excited, been waiting for a long time for this talk with Alex Gladstein. Uh, really um, a strong advocate and speaker when it comes to Bitcoin, tied and fused, you know, with the essence of what, you know, why Bitcoin? It's about freedom. And, uh, you know, as the chief strategy officer of the Human Rights Foundation and the Oslo Freedom Forum, and, you know, giving so many talks and, and, and interviews and doing, doing so much work in the background. So I think he's one of the key players here when it comes to human rights, freedom, civil liberties. So without further ado, you know, um, this is my talk with Alex Gladstein on Bitcoin, you know, the one and only hardest, scarcest, decentralized, uh, permissionless, uh, global, censorship-resistant, unconfiscatable money, a monetary revolution. All right, without further ado, this is my talk with Alex Gladstein. Hope you enjoy it. Please retweet it, like it, share it, whatever you do. Thank you so much for supporting, for listening. All right, Alex Gladstein, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Alex, thanks so much for the time. Um, you're the Chief Strategy Officer of the Human Rights Foundation and the Oslo mm -hmm. Freedom Forum. Could you just, for my listeners, just give a brief overview and the essence of your work? Sure. So um, the Human Rights Foundation is a nonprofit that focuses on helping dissidents and activists and democracy movements and civil society organizations inside authoritarian countries. So we look at about 95 countries, about 4.2 billion people, um, <clears throat> about 52% of the world's population that lives under a, a government structure that doesn't permit free press or an independent judiciary that uh, isn't really balanced out by other branches of government, you know, that sort of doesn't have free and fair elections, that you know, it doesn't really have a legal system where you can sue the government and force it to change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's a great many people who live under these societies and they don't have the same rights and freedoms as people in more open societies have, and they require uh, help as well. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of them can't create their own human rights groups. It's illegal to do so. So uh, they, or if it's not illegal, it's heavily persecuted, you know? So we assist them and we we try and do that in different ways so uh you can check out the work of the human rights foundation at uh on twitter at hrf or at hrf.org exactly yeah thanks so much um alex um i'm gonna get to the point which i really want you know because uh, you're one of the few people uh speakers advocates you know of human rights freedom and tied in with bitcoin and you're one of the mm -hmm. few people that i know um, that's why, you know, your, I guess your presentations, your, your, your speeches are so, have become so viral because you, you are able to, uh, within a few minutes, like condense, like succinctly, uh, make people comprehend why, why Bitcoin is so essential, uh, for the, whatever we call it, for the, for the process of, of unfolding, you know, the very inalienable rights, which we should all have, um, where do you see the root causes and what what would you say are the priorities or what are the effective practical solutions when it comes to, let's say, education or implementing, you know, Bitcoin infrastructures? Um, where would you start? Where's the root cause and where are the structural solutions? Yeah, so I think one thing that is worth focusing on is that Bitcoin kind of gives people real property rights for the first time ever, arguably. You know, what is a property right? Well, you know, <clears throat> it's like a contract you have with the government, right? And the government could violate that contract for any reason. And indeed, they do around the world. In some countries, the contract's harder to violate. In, in democracies, uh, there's a rule of law. You have to go to a court. Uh, it's very difficult for a government to just, like, take your stuff. Um, there are lots of rules and regulations. However, they can still do it in the end. Um, and in dictatorships, it's super easy for them to take your stuff. So Bitcoin, we have this idea that you could like store your value in something that they just, they can't take. I mean, there's not a whole, not a whole lot they can do. I mean, if they come to your house, they can say, oh, uh, this piece of real estate's ours now. You can leave. We're going to put you in a prison. Or... Um, Oh, where's the gold in your house? So they could have some thugs come to your house and take your stuff. Or 
if you have any asset stored with a third party, like a stock or any sort of investment or a trust, or they can just go to the people, you know, administering that particular asset and take it from you. So this kind of uh, has, has created a very interesting world where people have a very tenuous grip over, over kind of what's quote unquote theirs. Um, and even the stuff like cash and gold that's physical and like bare asset and in their ownership can still, you know, is still relatively vulnerable in terms of theft. All of a sudden we have Bitcoin, we have this way to store value that anyone in the world, regardless of their government or uh, nationality or gender or beliefs, you know, anyone can store their value in this asset and they can, you know, at the moment they can, uh, you know, create a password that essentially is 24 English words long and they can do whatever they want with that. They can memorize that. They could write it down on, you know, grave it into metal and they you can get virtually impossible for, for someone to get your private key. Um, yeah, they can still torture and kill you and whatnot, but like you could even make it so that you can't even give them your private key. You know, you could make it a multi-signature arrangement where they need a couple signatures and it's basically just going to make it a, a lot harder for, I think governments to do arbitrary things like long-term we're talking long-term here, but um, I just think it's so fascinating that, uh, we have the uh, property rights, which are essential to like what, you know, what we now know is like liberal democracy or open society. Um, and they've never really existed. They've always been just kind of like, like a tenuous agreement, you know, between parties. And now you like actually own your stuff. I mean, there's a, there's a saying that people like to discuss on the internet that, um, you know, you own your data or whatever we're going to build something that helps you own your data. I mean, well, I mean, again, 10 US, like probably it's on a cloud, it's stored on the cloud somewhere and someone else has it, or even if it's stored, there could be issues. And, and usually when people say, well, you're going to own your own data, they, they don't mean that it's going to live on like, like a phone, a burner phone that's not connected to the internet. Like they're, they're usually saying it in sort of active context. So Bitcoin is um, really incredible because you, if you do own your own data, like whether or not you, you agree that people should own their own, own their own data, whether or not you agree that people should or should not have property rights, it, it makes all these arguments a little moot because it gives you that ability. Regardless of people's philosophies or what they think about the world or how the world should be or should not be, Bitcoin is just inarguable. You know, it just doesn't debate. It just is. So it is a system where you can own value regardless of who you are, where you are, whether or not the government likes you or not, whether or not uh, you're in China or the United States or in South Africa or, or Brazil, it doesn't matter. You could be in outer space. It really doesn't matter. Um, so this idea that this asset is just permissionless, anyone can access it without having to ask permission from any authority without needing an okay and the fact that it's censorship resistant and the fact that it's confiscation resistant and it's it's extremely difficult to confiscate if you know what you're doing uh you know gives us uh just a remarkable invention in many ways but i, I like to to talk about uh, and think about the idea of how it's kind of the real the real version of property rights um, you know, I've been thinking a lot, um, Alex, about the, the structural solutions, because, you know, when we think about nation states, governments, central banks, and everything that's been going on around, uh, you know, uh, the last few days and weeks and a couple of months uh, uh, with, you know, encroachment on civil liberties, uh, you know, more and more surveillance, uh, uh, lockdown, uh, you know, because of this, whatever, you know, it's got to be taken seriously, of course, this whole Corona, whatever COVID-19 thing. But what, what would be an effective strategy? Because I've been thinking for myself, what could be my part, you know, uh, besides, you know, doing podcasts and interviews and educating people in German and English. I live in Austria. I'm originally from Iran. And I also, by the way, interviewed Zia, who, who I think you mentioned him once in one of your talks, you know, sort of mm -hmm. as a practical example. He's a real hero. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's amazing, you know, the, the way people 
still have to somehow get around or circumvent um, a lot of restrictions and, 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 and you know, a regime, this whole, you know, a ty tyrannical regime in Iran. Um, would you say, could, would you agree that maybe we should start with the smallest, uh, like merchants, businesses, you know, shop owners, like educate them that, you know, should that be the priority equipment, you know, with uh, whatever, you know, with a full node, BTC pay, pay server, the full knowledge and tools. I, I, I look, um, I don't think we should have the anxiety over our role and what, 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 what we need to do. Um, beautiful thing about Bitcoin is it is going to grow and it is going to expand and it is going to reach more people regardless of whatever we do. Like it doesn't, it doesn't need us. Like Bitcoin does not need any one person. It is truly decentralized as a social phenomenon. As more and more people learn about it, more and, people, more and more people will want to get involved. This is the most inevitable thing I've ever seen. Like, I mean, you know, once you start to understand what it actually is, you realize the inevitability of it. Um, so I've stopped being, you know, anxious about, oh my God, what should I do? What should we do? What are the priorities? I wrote a very long essay called A World Without Bitcoin mm -hmm. that you can see on uh, mm -hmm. Laura Shin's uh, website. And I go into a lot of details about like, well, if you, if you really want to like dedicate yourself to Bitcoin or advocating for it or learning more about it, like here, like I gave six areas that include things like um, usability, privacy, liquidity, et cetera. So yeah, if you're like an entrepreneur and you really care about Bitcoin, but you also want to create a company that's successful, there are so many different areas you could go in. If you're a policymaker and you want to warm what you're doing to this new technology there are many areas of improvement you can get into if you're a product designer if you're an artist if you're a graphic artist if you're a translator um if you're an author if you're a journalist i mean god knows there's so many different things you can do um it depends on what your skills and talents are but don't feel like you know bitcoin needs you or if like we don't do x bitcoin will fail um that's just not the case. It is, uh, is on a particular trajectory, which seems really inexorable. Um, now, uh, I, I, you know, that being said, yeah, I think education is probably the most important thing right now. Uh, as far as like, you know, if you want to think about the, for the average person who doesn't have any technical skills, it's education. So, I mean, there's nothing stopping you from like learning about Bitcoin. It'll take a while. It takes months, years even, but once you figure it out, um, it's something that you can spread as a gift to other people. Um, if you, if you are technically apt, if you are a coder and you want to like contribute to the Bitcoin project at that level, um, again, don't feel like you have to, but, uh, but if you want to, yeah, people will greet you with open arms and there's a lot of stuff with regard to privacy that I think is, is important for, for folks to contribute to and get involved with. Um, there's also a lot of stuff with regard to decentralization, both in mining and in the broader business ecosystem around Bitcoin that can be that can be worked on. So, I mean, there's many different areas that people could get involved, but, you know, it's you'll find open arms if you want to go do that. But don't feel like you have to, you know, it'll it'll be just fine without you. Something I've certainly mm -hmm. understood. No, I, also, I mean, I, mean I, I totally agree with you. I mean, it is permissionless and Bitcoin will do its thing. It's, you know, we, we don't need to contribute really. But what I'm trying, I think, to get at is that do you think we are, you know, at a precipice? Um, you know, it's sort of we're competing with, with a process here, you know, with um, more and more encroachment, civil liberties, the, the surveillance, like the whole, all these nations, yeah. states and governments I mean and regimes, you know, like. You have to zoom out. I mean, we're probably at a precipice, but it's many decades. You know, if you look at it from a 500 years, um, from the year, you know, 1800 to the year 2300 or something like that. Yeah, like our, this moment that we're in where we have digitized everything it is a precipice, but it's it's many, many decades long. So what a lot of people are finding out is like, there's not just going to be this like moment where there's like hyper Bitcoinization or whatever. Like it's this whole process takes so many, um, and you know, 
those of us who are younger, hopefully we'll get to see, we'll get to be around for kind of one of the most exciting parts. Like just in my lifetime alone, uh, I was born in the eighties. Like, okay. So when I, in my life I've seen or been around for the rise of the personal computer, the internet, uh, you know, e-commerce, uh, things like Uber and Airbnb and uh, podcasting, podcasts, obviously. Um, just, you know, the ability for people to interact with each other around the planet in an instantaneous way, the ability for people to have all the world's knowledge in their pocket, the ability for supercomputers to shrink the size of small devices, ridiculous innovations that have come in the medical and scientific um, fields around that. Uh, I mean, and we're, and we're about to witness what arguably might be the biggest innovation, which is the separation of money from state uh, with technology, yeah, with Bitcoin. <laughs> so I'm very grateful to be born now. This is a very mm -hmm. interesting time to be alive. Um, so uh, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. But even with like, I mean, look, again, it depends where you live. Like in Iran, you're literally seeing hyper Bitcoinization in a, in a way. If you live yeah. in Venezuela, I mean, you're watching your currency. Uh, if you look at a graph, of the Iranian real versus Bitcoin. I mean, you're seeing hyper Bitcoinization uh, yeah. in a way. I mean, yeah. it, it's not the full thing because like the, the dramatic sci-fi reality is that we're all using it. Well, that's not happening in Iran, but the value of the real versus Bitcoin is plummeting exponentially over mm -hmm. the last five years, right? Um, same thing in Venezuela, right? And there's a couple other countries where it doesn't look so good for the for the reigning champ, the fiat currency, whether it's Argentina over time, uh, whether it's Somaliland, uh, Zimbabwe. I mean, there's there's actually quite a few examples of really weak currencies over time. Um, <clears throat> but you know, most people like to think of this American centric economic paradigm where like the dollar is strong and. Yes, we have, you know, 2%, 3% inflation per year. Um, but generally speaking, it's, you know, Americans and people who buy American products and stuff, like generally speaking, don't really notice the inflation so much. Yeah. It's very gradual. It's actually and then higher, all of a, right? Yeah, and all of a sudden, like, all, you know, all these people got fired up over, like, quantitative easing. And there were all these Fed watchers and people concerned about the U.S. deficit. And this was all pre-coronavirus. And then... <laughs> You know, a lot of people were like, oh, my God, we're on a precipice. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, the Fed added all this stuff to its balance sheet and printed all this money 12 years ago. And, I mean, the dollar is still pretty strong. Like, it's not like, you know, there was, there was no, there was no, let's put it this way, there was no high inflation. There was, uh, there was just nothing of the sort it, it, for the average person. So what was really happening was inflation, but with other things like, stocks and real estate and education, healthcare, you know what I mean? Like the in yeah. inflation kind of like seeps into certain assets, but not others. But the average person was sort of led to believe that whatever happened in 2008, 2009, 2010 to fix the financial crisis in America and, and, and the rest of the world, um, you know, was essentially like a good thing and it was repeatable. And maybe if anything, we just didn't act fast enough. So now we're seeing that repeat again and we're seeing the balance sheet of the Fed grow to an extraordinary level where they're, you know, buying all these different kinds of assets that are questionable to the tune of trillions. Um, and you're seeing the U.S. deficit grow blow past, what, 23 trillion now. Um, you're seeing other countries go down this road, Japan, Britain, many others. Um, uh, and, we're, and we're just talking like advanced economies. Like, obviously, the dictatorships are, they've been doing this for years. But like, we're starting to see this approach of like, let's just print as much money as we need and the dollar will save us. The dollar will like be this backstop. Like, um, and in fact, right now the Fed can't even, the Fed can't print, like the Fed can't print money fast enough. Everybody else needs dollars, right? So it's a very interesting time. And I think people are starting to realize that like, there's not going to be this hyperinflationary moment, even though the Fed is printing trillions of dollars. It's just not going to work like that. However, I do think that over time, the dollar will devalue quite a bit, like exactly. over the next decade. Yeah, uh, that's what my economy is also Certainly, I mean, 
vis-a-vis different kinds of assets, but definitely vis-a-vis Bitcoin. And that's like the interesting thing. Everybody likes to look at the Bitcoin chart of like the price going up. I like to look at it the other way around. Like I look at, I like to look at it as how much Bitcoin does your dollar buy you? And it's yeah. kind of an amazing chart that just goes like this. Like it's just an exponential down, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And that's the one people should be thinking about, right? Like how much Bitcoin does your dollar buy you? And whereas, you know, again, Americans largely have been insulated from inflation, even though it's happening because it, it's, it's been controlled. Um, so this that even though currency, right? international reserve currency, I mean, it's, it's well, I'm just saying like, 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 okay, so a steak cost 12 cents uh, in the 1920s or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And now it costs uh, 20 bucks. Like, oh, okay. but that didn't happen. It happened so slowly that like, mm-hmm. it was never like, meh, like we had issues in the seventies, but like, you know, we, we, it wasn't like a lot of Americans just haven't seen it's not like we've seen high inflation where, where like our stuff's getting too expensive. Like that's just, if anything, we've seen deflation with like technology, like mm-hmm. if any computers and these headphones and all this stuff gets cheaper every, I mean, you know, for what it is, it gets cheaper every year. Like this same computer that I'm on now will be way cheaper in three years, Yeah, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. Like yeah. stuff gets cheaper. So we have this like deflationary uh, effect coming from our innovation and our ability to create better stuff more cheaply. And a lot of it is because of, of course, cheap labor from countries like China, et cetera. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, you've seen deflation arguably for a lot of people for a lot of the things they buy. And then you've seen inflation in real estate, healthcare, education, stocks, things like that. But like the government chooses this like basket of goods to, to determine inflation, yeah. uh, to determine your purchasing power. And it's like very specific. Like basically if one good is too volatile, they won't count it in the basket. So like oil's not in there or whatever. So it's just like, it's like grain, wheat, beef, like whatever. They, they figure out, they have like a Goldilocks thing where it's like, oh, just this, just these things we're going to put into this basket. And like, essentially from what I understand, you could make an argument. What they're basically doing is they're like, we want inflation to be X, like, whatever it is, 2%. Therefore, we're just going to actually start with that. And then we're going to work backwards and we're going to put stuff in the basket until we get to 2%. And anything that would make it higher or lower or whatever, we're just going to not count. That's not exactly true, but it's sort of what they've been doing over the years. So like, everybody's like, oh, it's cool. And again, like, because of this balance between deflationary forces in, in a lot of the things we buy and inflationary forces in some of the assets we want, um, you know, we haven't seen that like panic, you know, even though over the last 12 years, the, the government has printed trillions, you know, um, you know, we just haven't seen that panic. And I don't think we're going to see that panic moment probably in the near future. But like, that's the sneaky part about Bitcoin is that it's like, it's sneaky, like it doesn't hit you over the head with a big moment, like, okay, once in a while, its price will explode. And like, everybody will talk about it. But then like, so this asset went from a thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars in a year, and it demonstrated it could do that. It demonstrated it could do twenty x in a year, meaning it has demonstrated that people who bought at in December twenty sixteen and, and sold if they you know or, or not in twenty December twenty seventeen like they made twenty x in dollar terms. That wasn't even three years ago. Okay. And yet people have collectively forgot that that even happened. Like that's been total amnesia. So here we, here we are sitting at Bitcoin at close to $8,000. Okay. In the middle of this financial crisis and nobody cares. It's like perfect. So Bitcoin has figured out a way to like stay under the radar. Like it it would be impossible to, to dream of a situation like this happening in almost any other way. Like if you were to say, Hey, there's this new asset. It came out. It was invented in two. Like we're not talking like the 1700s when no one had no, like, like effective years, ways to like... communicate and share information. <laughs> like in the at the peak of the internet age, somebody invented an asset that went from being not worth anything in the matter of 10 years to being no in the matter of you know eight years to being worth twenty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Okay, yeah. or even just take where we are today, eight thousand dollars. Okay, fine. 
Which so is just a normal one in a matter of eight years from zero to eight thousand, right? I mean, it's part of the price formation. The yes, but like if you just said that to somebody, hey, this asset's very volatile, but in eight years it went from zero to eight thousand, they would be like, oh my god, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. I want to learn more about it. <laughs> and yet, Bitcoin has done that while staying under the radar. Like people have just kind of collectively not understood what has been happening here. It's so amazing and so sneaky and just bizarre. I, I don't understand. I just don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Like it's not going away. It's just weird. So yeah. it, it's strange. It's very strange, but it's, it's, it's almost beautiful because what that means is that governments don't pay it as much attention and people are sitting here building these badass privacy tools so that when you and I want to make a Bitcoin transaction in five years, good luck tracking it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, if you, you even just think about the stuff like PayJoin, I mean, which is going to get spread out more with BTC Pay Server and Green Wallet and Blue Wallet. And in like two years, everybody's going to have PayJoin. And it's like, okay, great. Common input heuristic, common input ownership, common ownership input heuristic broke. Like you can't just assume that every transaction is just one party. And that really helps, right? So it's like, that was just a little trick that, you know, somebody developed like not that long ago. And we have all these little tricks and we have Lightning Network and we have all these things. So it's, it's kind of amazing that like it's under the radar, despite the fact that it's had an astronomical price increase. Um, yeah. I don't think that'll ever happen again. I don't think you'll ever see an asset um, increase in value by so much while the world pays so little attention. I, I just, right. it just doesn't yeah. compute for me. Mm-hmm. It's so bizarre, but it's like a, it's like a defense mechanism for Bitcoin. It's yeah. like a camouflage. It, 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 it's so improbable and weird that, Nobody pays any attention. And maybe it's complexity. Maybe it's new. Maybe it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. Maybe that helps with its camouflage. But, I mean, it's, it's just incredible to watch happen, really. Just, just stunning to just observe, really, truly. Yeah, as you're speaking, you know, I've been always, you probably know this quote from Hayek, the Austrian economist, where he says, uh, you know, we, need, we cannot take, take the money out of, you know, violently out of the hands of the government. What we can do is, like, create a sly roundabout way to something that they cannot take away. And yeah. And, and that's it, right? It's accurate. I think it's something else I'd also say is that like, like we've covered how, you know, there's not going to, you know, Bitcoin is not going to have a moment, a day where like everything mm-hmm. changes. It's going to take many decades and it's going to be very slow and it's super tricky and it's, it's to its benefit because that means it like slowly seeps in to our institutions and our norms and our society. But it's just, it's, it's doing it in a way that's very, it's almost like it has an intelligence. It's really bizarre. Like, it, like it's almost as if it has an AI, like that it's like a thing that it, <laughs> it knows what it should do. Um, it is, it is, you would, if you were like an, an alien watching this little experiment happen on this planet earth right now, you'd be giving the Bitcoin AI an A plus for its job <laughs> yeah, exactly. in infiltrating our society like to such a crazy extent without anybody noticing like it's really weird um but i mean generally speaking uh maybe it'll come to me but anyway the general point was that bitcoin remains under the radar which is extraordinary given its performance just straight up price performance to date i mean it's pretty incredible like still few people have paid it much attention only a tiny fraction of the world what maybe one percent at most ish like 50 60 million people own any bitcoin uh and only a tiny percentage of those people understand what bitcoin is right micro fraction i mean i go to these like crypto conferences or whatever and like trust me but most of them don't understand what bitcoin is so we're, we're talking like a very small percentage of people who who understand um so we're really really early um we're not, I don't, so I don't think we're close to a tipping point. If you actually look at the adoption of technologies, they follow an S curve, right? Um, which is like, basically, you know, it goes like this over time. It's like, it's like, you know, Bitcoin's here, uh, very few users over time, very few users. And then all of a sudden it's going to like go like this. And then over time, it's going to like ask them to the other way uh, uh, so that you know, it's not going to get to hundred percent of the population, but if you look at anything like a refrigerator, washing machine, television, they all follow this S curve, mm-hmm. um, where 
it beginning very expensive and nobody has them and then they go mainstream and then 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the population has them, right? Mm -hmm. So all technologies follow this S curve. So Bitcoin, you know, while I I wouldn't call it a technology, it's more like a social phenomenon. I, I do believe it'll follow a similar S curve, but we're not near that tipping point yet. I just I just don't think so. I think it'll happen in my lifetime for sure. I, I think it'll happen probably in the next decade or two. Yeah, but it's still I so mean, early. Yeah, it could happen, you know, unexpectedly sometimes. I mean, it, thinking, yeah, you know? it could happen tomorrow, but I, I, I just, <laughs> I just, I, I don't know. <laughs> it probably won't. It'll, it'll probably take a little more time and it'll probably be this long process of people just gradually getting rid of their disbelief. Like many people are just in denial. They don't believe, they don't understand what Bitcoin is. They, they don't understand. believe right. what it is and, mm -hmm. and they'll get there. I mean, look, the thing is, I can do as much education as I, as I can do, and I love doing it, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I can help people get involved earlier because, you know, look, look at the internet and the way it's changed the world. It's like, imagine how many people wish they had been involved earlier in the internet for whatever reason, mm -hmm. maybe scientific, maybe for commerce, maybe for investment reasons, maybe for being able to, like, understand how they should have steered their company better. To, to handle this new thing. So like a lot of people wished that they had learned about the internet in the early nineties and they had thought about it carefully, like it really would have been better for them. So if I can like help people understand that they should be thinking about Bitcoin very carefully now, like that's, I, to me, that's like a gift, right? That I could give to somebody and help them think about this. Regardless, whether they like Bitcoin or not, just, just to help them prepare for what's coming, right? That's my hope when I, and that's why I try to do what I do and speak to new audiences about it. And, you know, hopefully it, hopefully it makes a difference. Um, I certainly would like the human rights activists of the world and the journalists and dissidents of the world to understand it before governments do like, that would be really great. So that's primarily what I focus on is, is trying to help activists and dissidents understand that there's uh, money and the value technology they can use that is beyond the control of governments and corporations that's very important. But a tipping point, I don't think, I mean, again, we could have a black swan thing happen, but I just feel like we're too early and the dollar is too strong and too many people need it. And the Fed can print a lot of it. And I, I, I just sort of think the current system is not dead yet. It's not ready to die. Uh, it, it, there's like, what are people even going to do? Like if China and Japan want to shift to a different global yep. currency to rely on for their savings. Like they mm -hmm. each own more than a trillion dollars of dollar. I'm even saying it. I mean, the unit of account for the world. They each own, I don't, I don't, because it's, we're so dollar centric that I've never even heard someone quote what China owes the United States in some other increment, right? So, okay, so they both own over a trillion dollars of treasuries, okay? So if they lost faith in the dollar, they would dump the treasuries, and they would buy something else, but what are they going to buy? Like, you're not going to, I mean, the Euro and the yen Euro is like the EU is like falling apart. Like yeah, the insolvent. Japanese yen is, German banks are is arguably, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't feel great about investing in that. The RMB is, is full of, you know, built on lies. Like who mm -hmm. knows what's going on over there. So it's not like there's a better what do you do. The rupee, like, I, like it, it, it's not like there's a better currency out there. So even though the Fed is going to be acting as the central banker of the world and printing all this money, like at an infinitum, essentially, I think this system can live for, and again, I have problems with the system. That's why I advocate for Bitcoin. I think it's terrible and wrong that a small group of people can determine where all the money goes and there can be so much favoritism at the top and that all these big companies, whether it's in Russia or the United States, all the big companies get bailed out first. The little guy gets bailed out later. You know, the people that actually make up our society get bailed out later. I think it's wrong and it's broken. That's why I like Bitcoin. But like, I don't think it's ready to die yet. You know, I think a lot of people in the Bitcoin community are like ready for the system to die. And number one, it's not ready to die yet. And number two, that's not going to be something you should hope for. Like, it's going to be so brutal. I mean, it's going to be so terrible. Like the, the yeah. death throes of the modern economic system are going to cause so much pain and suffering yeah, for definitely. so many people. But the transition, I mean, uh, you, know, you can't make it like so smooth. I mean, we can make it as smooth as possible, but, I, you know. I think it's going to be smooth just based on so far. Like mm -hmm. 
it's just people are so cautious about Bitcoin, adopting it and using it. Like, and it, it, because it's complex to understand, its adoption curve grows very slowly. So I, I think the transition will be, I mean, look, even in a bullish, optimistic thing, you're looking at, okay, well, maybe some people start using it as a, um, maybe, 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 you know, over the next five to 10 years, you see people start to use lightning based products to buy and sell things without disclosing their identity so that, you know, the, their reason for doing it primarily would be speed and privacy, right? Maybe you see some of that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe you see, you know, but at the end of the day, I don't know how far that's going to go until, until Bitcoin becomes less volatile. Like it, like they'd have to be able to like use lightning kind of as like their checking account. Yeah. But a lot of people are just going to want to convert back into dollars. Right. So there's, mm -hmm. but people are building that infrastructure. Okay. So yeah. it's like, okay, maybe, maybe that picks up. I think it's inevitable that some central banks are going to want to start accumulating some Bitcoin reserves. I mean, some probably already have them, yeah, that's but gonna trigger it, it would just make sense right because yeah. it, it can break sanctions. So if you're mm -hmm. like Iran or whatever, what, you know what I mean? We want to have Bitcoin. So if you're Russia and you're trying to build a sovereign non-American, you know, economic base, like I think that um, governments will start acquiring it and there'll be more use cases and it's going to be interesting to track. Like, again, it won't be a mo I don't think it'll be a moment or, or a tipping point. It'll be, it'll be a process that takes many, many decades and will be very interesting to watch, but certainly better if you can get involved now. Like I, I do believe that in the far future, it would be like inconceivable to own a Bitcoin. Like that won't even, that's just so impossibly mm -hmm. large of a sum of money. So if you actually just divide it up, supply of Bitcoins by the inequality curve of the world today in dollars, um, obviously a very back of the envelope, estimate but i thought it was interesting at today's prices you could with 26 us dollars buy what will be the median ownership of bitcoin like let's say in a hyper bitcoinized hyper bitcoinized world so in a world where bitcoin um becomes like the main if you were to paint the science fiction future of, of a world where yeah, bitcoin uh, is like you know, the main unit of account of the world. i mean why not and you're to and you're to track well, well, uh, there's a lot of reasons why not, but like, let's just say it, it maybe happens in the far future. Um, mm -hmm. And you track the current, because I don't believe Bitcoin will solve inequality, for example. I think it, it will continue to, that will just, that's part of human nature, that we're, that we're not all equals, right? So if you just track the current um, inequality uh, curve of the world and, and look at, you know, the what the the wealth owned by certain percentages of population, right? The average person in the far future in this scenario would have the amount of Bitcoin that $26 buys you today. So, you know, today Bitcoin's like $7,800 or whatever. So owning, a, you, you quickly see that owning a Bitcoin would be, let's see, four, 40 times. I mean, you're talking like, a Bitcoin would be like 250 times more uh, money than the average person will have. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know, like if the yeah. average person has a $5,000, mm -hmm. like, okay, you can start, you can start realizing like what this is going to look like. So you can it's get in a now, world. You know, it's whether, like, you, it's care, about, like, whether you care about somebody, you want to make a donation. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm just saying like now's an opportunity. You can get in, you could buy a small amount of Bitcoin and you can like leave it for mm -hmm. a church or a mosque or, a, you know, an educational center or your grandchildren or God knows what. It's, it's just something interesting that like we have this technology that this monetary technology, this social phenomenon that's going to grow in the future. And you can right now acquire it ridiculously cheaply, you know? Yeah. And that's just an interesting thing to think about, right? And about, you know, the purchasing power, I mean, we're going to live eventually, hopefully, you know, in a deflationary world, as you said, you know, talk about the technologies, but then everything going to be deflationary and people uh -huh. will for the first time yes. be able to save and, and have, you know, exponential okay. purchasing power. Let me, yeah, here, and I remember what I was going to say. So, <laughs> okay. um, from earlier, uh, we were talking about, uh, right before we started getting Hi. to the tipping point conversation. Yeah. So 
Yeah. So you talk about deflation. So what's interesting is that even in a Bitcoin society, there will be other money. Like mm-hmm. if we live in, like, I don't, I don't, I can't comprehend of a, a way we would live without governments or without something that resembles governments. So governments will always create debt. So, and people will value that debt at some value and that debt will be traded, right? Just like it is now. So I believe governments will always create uh, debt, okay? Um, Regardless of whether it's a Bitcoin society or not. So, I mean, we're not going to really get away from that, in my opinion. Uh, There will always be, um, if you live in a town or a society and you trust it on some level, then you, you know, you'll, you know, you'll be able to, you know, buy, you to give it some of your money and get something back. And th- this cycle, I think will continue even, even if Bitcoin really takes root. So um, that's one point I just wanted to generally make. I, I think we, we would be fooling ourselves if we thought that even in a hyper Bitcoinization scenario, there wouldn't be any government money or a government value like that, that that will still exist. People will still need to use, um, I mean, people will still, you know, want to start a company and let's say they only have, I don't know, 50 million Satoshis to their name, but they want to start the next Microsoft. Yeah. They're going to seek investment. They're going to get a loan. Like we're like all this part of the financial system will still be there. You know, all these loans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very important. Um, so there's still going to all be this stuff. And, uh, you know, a lot of it will, will happen gradually. And I just think, I think it'll look less, maybe it looks less dramatically different than we think it's going to, that's all I got to say. Um, but the deflationary thing is interesting. Like, you know, there is, there are lots of good arguments to, to obviously say that a, a deflationary economy would be bad. Like I understand the arguments that say it would be good, but let's put it this way. I'm skeptical. Like the, there's, there's copious evidence to suggest that like, um, like it's not, it, it's not necessarily great if, um, if, you know, wages um, are going down in a way that's, that's not exactly fixed with price, you know, um, deflation at its core means contraction, right? It means shrinking. So, well, to but me, would, it, 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 would it not it mean Alex, right? like abundance about like like we're gonna have like abundance you know with deflationary uh, words yeah no i i know the reason i know the argument for like a more deflationary economy but I, i'm just saying we should be careful because you know that that's that's just an idea at this point like mm-hmm. if anything like and i know people want to go back 100 years or whatever but Good. Here's the good news. We can argue all day about inflation and deflation and whether we think one's better than the other or whatever. Um, Bitcoin doesn't care. It like literally just doesn't care. So like yeah. it will just shrug along. It'll do its thing. It will act as whatever we wanted to use it as. If humans decide we want to use it as a reserve currency, we'll use it as a reserve currency. If we want, if we want to use it as payments, we'll use it as payments. We want to use it as like a kind of a kind of gold standard ish type thing for the economy, which naturally just kind of limits the amount uh, of credit that can be created. Um, great. Like, I, I think it'll just sort of end a lot of arguments, at, you know, as we go forward, like it just, just cause it is, you know, this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about property rights. Like it's just a paradigm breaker. Like it, now you can actually have property rights. You can have something is yours and, if you want to, no one else can have it, you know, like, you know, that's crazy. Like that's not been possible before. So it's super hard for us to sit here and predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, yes, there will be some sort of like, you know, productivity will go, will go up and there'll be more abundance and things will get cheaper. I, I understand that. That'll be great. Um, but uh, I do think that that will be in line with governments that issue debt and, and, and are elected by people and people ask the government to do stuff. And a lot of people think governments should provide um, subsidies in different parts of the economy and, 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 
you know, that they should provide welfare systems and things like that. And, I, you know, I think it'd be unreasonable to expect that to disappear. So even if we have this more, this like utopian, like abundance, productivity, inflationary economy based on the idea of like what the tech sector has, um, it, it live in a world separated from people who want stuff, who, you know, who like yeah. control the government and they were going to force the government to do stuff. So I think you're still going to have fiat money in a, living in a relationship with Bitcoin, right? So mm -hmm. maybe the modern monetary people will win out. It seems like they are at the moment. Um, and fiat money will look very different in the future. Like they want, basically they want the American, average American to have a savings account with the Fed and a checking account with the treasury. Mm -hmm. So interesting. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, they want bailouts to go directly to people as opposed to corporations. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not, that's not, that, that's generalizing, but like they, they want the whole thing to be digital so that when the government needs to like, or wishes to like give 1200 bucks to everybody, they don't, they don't have to worry about bureaucracy. They can just credit their account immediately. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're going to see that proceed the evolution of our political economic system will start to, I think, proceed down the MMT route, it seems, which is going to be fascinating to watch how they interact, how that, the, that interacts with Bitcoin, which will, which will also be advancing and evolving and growing, you know? And at the end of the day, I just think you have two very different things. You have fiat money, you have Bitcoin, like they both will exist. They will, they will obviously, I think people will use Bitcoin for different things, but like there will always be a need for, I think at least in the near term for, for governance to be able to like issue, mm -hmm. you know, debt, um, to have bonds, to, um, be able to make loans, things like that, to, to issue credit. And we'll have to see how it goes. I mean, it was a grand experiment, but I, I think that this idea that there's going to be this trigger moment, I think is going to be many, many decades. I think Bitcoin is very clever. It's very slow. It's very gradual. People are very skeptical of it. It's going to take a long time. And from a political economic point of view, um, a lot of the current trends that people feel like are unsustainable are actually pretty sustainable and are going to last for a long time. And that's just, it's made it frustrating for some people because they want it to happen now, now, now. And you know what? I will assign a non-trivial chance to this idea that there's this black swan thing and then all of a sudden the dollar collapses. Like, it could happen. Yeah. It's written about in the this book, The Mandibles, like in a fairly conceivable way. Like if the U.S. just like, you know, renounces a debt, it's debt, and people flock away from the dollar and they go somewhere else. The thing is, in that book, people flocked to, like they had an answer. They had this thing called the bank core. Obviously, you know, a historical throwback reference, but uh, mm -hmm. They had created a bank core, like all the, mm -hmm. other, all the other countries, without telling the U.S. So when they moved away from the dollar, they, had, they moved away to something else. They don't have that, that right now. So even this like fantastical thing where the dollar is going to collapse, where is everybody going to go? You know, there, there yeah. just is no better answer. And Bitcoin's not ready yet. It's just not. Like people yeah. don't know about it. Right? No, I agree with you. And Maybe you know, it would be ready in 20 years. Yeah. You know what what are they going to go into? What are they going to go into? The... the <laughs> the the Iranian real like I don't think so <laughs> no like, I don't think so but do you see like more uh, you know in the context of, let's say of human right because you know it's freedom you know human right do you see like more secessions localism uh, clusters of you know local economies emerging uh, you know on the basis of Bitcoin more independence it's very freedom. difficult to say I mean what what the couple of things I would I would just probably try and observe based on the way Bitcoin works is that uh, if you take the tack that long term, it'll be this kind of reserve type currency. It may even be like a Bitcoin standard type situation. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So in that reality, it, you know, the credit will be, won't be as easy. Like there won't be as much of it floating around because um, it'll be tied to how much Bitcoin you have. And um, I think that would reduce like the amount of wars countries fight because those are very expensive and they tend to just be like easily, you know, funded with easy money. Um, so maybe we become less violent. I mean, that would be nice. Um, that's one, that's a, that's a very utopian way of looking at it, but 
it's certainly a theory that some people have that in a Bitcoin standard, there would be less war. Mm -hmm. uh, that when the government needs to fight that war, they actually have to like go get that money. I mean, this is what well, it used to be like. The to counter me. to that would be <laughs> the counter to that would be the world was pretty friggin' violent. Uh, you know, pre fiat money. You know, mm -hmm. um, so it's unclear. We'll have to see. I, I mean, I, I, I look all I, you know from on the human rights angle. All I know is the following: like, all of a sudden people have an asset now, they can access it without needing to prove their identity. They can acquire it without needing to ask permission from a government. They can send it to anyone else on earth in minutes. Uh, they can do it relatively privately. They can do it in a way where it can't be confiscated or, or confiscation is like extremely difficult. Um, no one can censor it. And that's really extraordinary to me. And I, I think that once more and more people realize we have this global borderless asset that's universal, that's for everybody. Um, more people will flock to it and we just we have a poor understanding of what's that what that's gonna do to the world i mean it's fun it's been fun chatting with you about some of these topics but like we don't really know um i tend to think that it's going to be very gradual and the current system will exist a lot longer than people think it will um and it'll hold on it'll fight i mean honestly we're going to see a huge fight at some point maybe it'll be over many many years but the powers that be are not going to like Bitcoin because it, you know, yeah. it's fundamental. Kind of robs yeah. them of their, it robs the them of their abilities. Yeah. yeah, it kind of robs them of their abilities and their and their and their senior special privileges, right? So, at some point, there's going to be some sort of battle, but it, you know, we'll have to see where that goes. But um, no, Bitcoin's definitely like a radical difference maker for human rights, just because it just over time people will realize this, that, that it allows anybody, no matter what country, no matter what government you have to access, access an asset that those governments don't control. They can't stop you from using, they can't stop you from storing wherever you want, they can't stop you from sending to anyone else. Um, and the supply schedule is just known to all and it's transparent and we all know when the Bitcoins are gonna be minted and how many there will be. And that's, a demo, that's just like knowledge that we all have, as opposed to this being, a backdoor deal in a smoky room um, orchestrated by people who are obviously gonna like make decisions that interest them, that, you know, in their own interests, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be different. You know, the creation and distribution of money will be, would be different in that scenario, which is one of the reasons I think it's so important. Wow. Alex, yeah. I really enjoyed our talk. Do you have like any uh, final thought or, or a wish, a vision or any message? Sure. You give yeah. The listeners? final thought is the following. Like, like I think most people involved in crypto and Bitcoin, at least who are vocal about it are in the West. They're in America, they're in Europe. Like, and again, our monetary systems work pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, and even Bitcoin's critics, all of them come from the West, you know, all of them come from, you know, all the, you know, Europe and America and like, you know, that's just not their economic reality for the rest of the world. Like a lot of people, there are billions of people who live in countries where the government, you know, doesn't respect your property rights, takes your money, inflates your money, seizes your money, um, changes the money, uh, does, you know, confiscation and suspension of different kinds of notes, um, does demonetization. I mean, God knows what. So for a lot of people around the world, the system is broken. And Bitcoin is a really compelling thing that, that, that may help them bridge that gap and give them the tools they need to do what they want to do. Um, I think because of the fact that the economic system has grown so defended and so strong in many ways in the West, and so you know, at the expense of, all, of, of everybody, the elite can kind of prop it up, and keep it going mm -hmm. as like a zombie, you know, probably for a long time. Uh, I mean, we just worked for three months, you know, like everybody's kind of like giving an obituary for like this modern economy, but we're like four months after all time highs, you know, in the U S stock market. So I don't, <laughs> yeah, that's um, a bubble. <laughs> and even with the inflation, like, yeah. yeah, it's true, but like, but it'll pop and then it'll grow again. Like we, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like this monster is just going to die. Like this thing is the way the world works. And I think it's going to take many, 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 many years or decades to, to disappear completely, if if it, if it, if at all, um, I mean, again, even in a world where 
you have something like Bitcoin or Bitcoin as the as the standard in some ways, like you're going to have greed, human greed and human speculation and human desire to borrow more than they can afford and all these things. And maybe maybe a Bitcoin standard creates a culture where, where those things are tempered, but like they're still going to exist. You're still going to have inequality. You're still going to have corruption. You're still going to have dictatorship. So I mean, maybe hopefully it makes these things more expensive or hard to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's a hope. You know, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, hopefully war and dictatorship less feasible. Um, hopefully it introduces a, a tighter grip over the government by the citizens. I mean, one of the main reasons governments are able to abuse their citizens so much is that they control the money and the money supply. Exactly. So once citizens are in charge mm-hmm. or they're, everybody's in charge, regardless yeah. of who you are, yeah. then it, it really changes the game because it really prevents governments from just like doing whatever they want. Like they, they actually have to like go seek the counsel of the citizenry. And like, I, I think again, there could be this very utopian vision where like it does really bring the world more into alignment and there's less abuse and less war and less violence because of this idea that every, everybody's kind of equal in the eyes of Bitcoin and you can't just create more of it on demand. And we all have to play by those rules. It, it, it's, it could be a very beautiful vision. Who knows? Um, certainly something I think about, but again, that's decades from now, if it even happens. And in the meantime, we get to be alive for a grand experiment and something that's going to be really interesting to watch as the world kind of tests the limits of its existing system, continues to print more money and everybody goes crazy for the dollar. I mean, eventually it's going to pop, right? Uh, you know, but who knows? Who knows how long that could be? It could yeah. be a while. So the could individual sovereignty empowerment is really important right now, huh, Alex? I mean, really understanding the Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we've seen the world's global institutions betray us, the World Health Organization. We've seen mm-hmm. the Chinese Communist Party. We've seen even the U.S. government be totally incompetent when it comes to coronavirus. So I think there's a skepticism of big global institutions and, and big governments, and there's a fear, and, and people are retreating to their communities and their families and their there's a bit of localism, regionalism. I think that's going to happen, some sort of backlash. Unsure to what extent, but like, I, I, I do think we've seen the power of decentralized responses to things. And it's certainly something that could be a good thing for us. So we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah. Well, I got to get but somehow. Thanks for having me on. Over my uh, impatience, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, the monetary evolution will come. It's just a matter of time, you know, so. But it's really Be patient, man. Yeah, I mean, it's happening. No, no, no. The monetary evolution is here. It, yeah. it, it's, it, it's Bitcoin. But like, the question is, mm. how long will it take? And the answer could be a very long time. So just be grateful that you're here for the beginning and, and it's going to be tough and people are going to lose faith and there's just endless social attacks on Bitcoin and people saying it doesn't work or it's not going to do X, Y, or Z. And you just have to tune that out, man. It's just going to continue chugging along, you know? <laughs> so, but it, you know, it may, it may not, it may not be like the speed demon you want it to be when it comes to taking over the world. Let's put yeah. it that way. Yeah. We're all doing our best. I think, you know, our best effort. Uh, well, Alex, thank you so much for your time and hope we can repeat this sometime in the future. And yep. I had a blast, soon. man. Take care. Thank Later. you. So much. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. All right. So really enjoyed my insightful talk with Alex Gladstein. Make sure you check him out on hrf.org, humanrightsfoundation.org, or Awesome Freedom Foundation. Check him out on, on Twitter. I'm going to put those in the, sh- in the show notes, at Gladstein. And yeah, if you want to help me, support me in any way, if you are ethical Bitcoin responsible, get in touch with me. My email address is hello at thetotalconnected.com, or you can just get, get in touch with me via Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, social media, Telegram, or what have you. It's all in the show notes. And I would really appreciate a positive review, a like, a retweet, a share. And yeah, do your best. Educate yourself. Get yourself a bit, some Bitcoin. Uh, spread the, you know, this knowledge, this comprehension. Um, get yourself a harder wallet, uh, or at least a mobile wallet for, you know, if you, if you buy just the smallest fraction of a Bitcoin. And yeah, and, you know, empower yourself. That's, that's our chance. This is the precipice I'm talking about. This is the monitor revolution. And uh, it's, it's all depends, you know, on each of one of us as individuals and as a society, as a civilization. All right. I'm the total connector.
signing off. Thank you so much for supporting and for listening to the Bitcoin podcast. So bye bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.